Hey everybody, welcome into this beautiful, beautiful room, the Zoom room. There's something magical that happens when we just take time to sit with another human being with no agenda and just love them and accept them, listen to what they say, acknowledge that they, and hear what they say, not only listen, but hear, and then acknowledge and validate what they're saying is what they're saying to them. In my 65 years of life, no one's ever said to me, I want you to agree with me. And yet when I look around the world, it seems like what we believe has become the main reason of why we're friends with somebody. But I have some friends that have the weirdest beliefs in the whole world. I would never believe what they believe. Yet if push came to shove, I would take a bullet for them because I love them for who they are and not for what they believe. So in a world where we are choosing and to cancel our friendships and our family members because of what they believe, I just want this to be a little oasis where people have the ability to feel heard and listened to, to feel understood and acknowledged, and to just be able to express what they want to say without hesitation, without, without fear that they will be attacked or, or criticized or canceled because of what they believe. The reason I'm doing all of this is because of the book over my left shoulder. The mosaic is a story about a boy who loses his parents two years apart on the same day. And when he asks the adults where his parents are, they tell him they're in a place called heaven. So he sets out in search of the place called heaven. He wants to find his parents. But the people he meets are not the people you would imagine him to meet. They're common, ordinary people. And he wonders why, why he's meeting these people. Like, why would he meet these people? But he, feel, he realizes, hey, you know what? I'm here with them. Why don't I spend a few minutes and just listen to them? Let them, let them tell me their stories and see what happens afterwards. In 100% of the cases, the person he walks away from is completely different than the person he thought he was sitting down next to. And it wasn't because they changed. It was but because in listening to their story, the preconceived notion he had of the homeless man or the juice man, or the garbage man, or the road worker, had completely transformed because he saw what they believed, what they thought, what they felt. And when I finished the book, the book told me, get out on the road and do that. Go and talk to the people nobody talks to, listen to the people nobody listens to. And I had my whole trip planned out, and then COVID came. And so I wasn't going anywhere. So I sit now in the comfort of my own sitting chair in my home, and talk to people all around the world. As they respond to a post that's called 50 Conversations with 50 Strangers. Hundreds of people have responded. I've had hundreds of conversations. Each one in its own way, fascinating. And some are boring, some are great, some are not so good, some are fabulous. But each one is fabulous because we get to know another human being and hear what they think and believe. This is never meant to be a monologue. It's turning into one. I apologize for that. My sponsor will be very happy if you like the story of the mosaic and you buy the book. Now we're finished with that. We turn the page and in the room with us right now is Jane Warlow. Jane, how are you? Who are you? And what brings you to the room today? <laughs> oh my gosh. There's some big questions that I think it's going to probably take me a lifetime to answer, Daniel. Um, who am I? Um, gosh, there's so many different labels I could stick onto myself to tell you who I am. To give you a bit of access, I guess, into me, I'm a British, you can probably tell that. I live in America, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I um, moved here very intentionally to give my children, my three children, um, a wider perspective of the world, I think is probably... So despite the fact that when anybody meets me, they say, oh, you've moved from England. Did your husband get a job here? <laughs> um, no, my husband works with me and we, we came together. Um, I am um, an executive coach. I've worked in the global space for many, many years with some of the world's leading brands. And last year I had an experience that shifted my relationship with the world. 
it's not the first time that's happened to me. I've had it happen before. But um, I realized that after nearly three decades working in change, I'd had a very limited perspective of what change is. And now I am uh, refusing to work with people who are not part of helping either themselves or their businesses become a force for good in the world. I have aligned, I have more than one business and I've aligned them with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, probably the best framework we have right now for the transformation that the world needs. And that's what I take a stand for in my life, is how do we turn this ship around? How do we deal with the complex challenges that we're facing as humans? How do we get through all the false news, all the stuff to actually get to the truth and do the work that is ours to do? Wow, a lot to unpack. An awful lot. <laughs> a lot to unpack. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Mm. Um, I think everybody, I, I certainly have a beautiful be beginning to knowing who you are. <laughs> And, and I so appreciate that. And so I want to be the voice of the listener because Ooh. you and I may know certain terminologies and certain things, and they may right. be very commonplace to us. But I want to make sure the listener doesn't feel neither intimidated nor, nor um, embarrassed that they don't know or what that means. Yeah. Um, briefly. When you say you're an executive coach and you work with some of the biggest companies in the world, what exactly does that mean in a layman's terms for someone to understand? What is it? Why does someone hire you to come into their company? What is it they want you to do? Well, that's where things get funny because I get hired usually for an external reason. So it could be that, um, I don't know, um, an individual isn't performing well in their leadership or a CEO has just taken over a new company and, um, you know, they're not getting on so well with the rest of the board um, or um, they're not performing in the way that they all want to perform. Or maybe the CEO brings me in because their, their, um, their board is not um, communicating well together or there's conflict. I, um, so I am a business strategist, but I tend to work with leaders in their leadership now, what that means is I help leaders define the tone of the organization, the culture of the organization, and we look at how we can get things running smoothly so they can fulfill whatever goals they have in the world. And that can be individual, team, or indeed a change initiative that embraces the whole organization. Fabulous. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's gonna, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and dive into it a little bit dif different. <laughs> okay. Do you find that in the work that you've done, that there are certain common denominators that exist everywhere you look? Or is each company pretty much individual in the approach and you really have to redesign the wheel for each company? And I know each company is slightly different, but I'm talking about the overriding themes of what, of what happens. I feel like you, I don't know you either, and I feel like you have some experience in this field yeah. <laughs> just by that question, Daniel. So um, my clients like to think that they are completely unique and there is nobody else like them in the marketplace or indeed in the world. My experience tells me something quite different in that a lot of leaders and organizations are facing similar challenges. And yes, there are nuances, of course there are, because every organization just like every person has a different experience and view of the world and the context that they're in but there's an awful lot of similarities there's a lot of threads that go through my work and kind of bring bring the challenges together in a way that i think my clients would be surprised about yeah in that they we're, we're facing very similar things lots of organizations are too it's so interesting because you're, you're right. I have done a bunch of work in this. <laughs> well. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so it takes a blind person to see another blind person perhaps. Right. Or, right. 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 Uh, and so, 
And I think one of the things that I always tried to do when I went into work, and I, I'm lobbing this over as a question to you. Uh, okay. By, by sharing my experience. Um, is I would come into companies who thought they were very different and show them how similar they were. Yeah. Only to then help them to become very unique and different. Right. Does that make sense to you? It makes absolute sense to me. Yes. Oh. Yes. Very similar. Um, and what's interesting to me is um, in this work, my work has completely changed, really. I've had um, a number. So I started my first consultancy in 96, 1996, and um, it was in London. And we were, I mean, amazingly successful. Um, and at the end of that, uh, so well, during that time, I gave birth to my third child. And during that time, I sustained a massive medical injury that meant I had to sell my company. Wow. Thankfully, it was doing really well. So, um, and I'd, I'd done a good job so that I could sell it well. But what happened then was, I won't go into the whole details, but I, I want to tell you how this changed my entire view of work, which was that um, I was... Uh, misdiagnosed for 11 months when I finally collapsed I lived in a rural part of England and then I collapsed in London and managed to get 11 months after the injury the medical injury I had received I I, I uh, got a diagnosis from a London hospital I was then bedridden I was put immediately on opiate medication for pain relief because I was in a lot of pain I had numerous surgeries nothing worked I was given a terminal diagnosis after being uh, bedridden and wheelchair bound for three years with one of the top neuro urologists. I had a bladder, kidney and spinal cord issue. And, and then uh, with a really horrible doctor um, who had no bedside manner, was told to go home and make the most of the time I had left with my children. Wow. This was in 2004. I wanted to get off the opiate medication. She told me I never would. And at the end of that, I fell to pieces. And then it was about a few months later, I started to realize that, uh, like I have a background in psychology. I'm also an energy and spiritual healer. But my two worlds of leadership and business and strategy and energy and stuff over here had never met. Mm. And after I healed myself with a number of uh, unorthodox medical practitioners, let's call them that way, and I found my way back to health because this was before Bruce Lipton published the uh, biology of belief. I came back to work with the help of Louise Hay and her book, you can heal your life. And, um, going back into work, I went into a large global corporate. They called me back an ex client that didn't know I'd been ill called me in and I was walking across an open plan office to get to his corner office. And I could feel the energy draining out of me, Daniel. Wow. And at that moment, I knew that my work of energy and healing and sacred and spiritual had to come together with leadership and business and strategy because there was no energy in this office. It was like walking into the living dead. And even though I'd done what I thought was really great work up until that point, it changed everything. Yeah. Because once I integrated energy, once I integrated everything I've learned about flow and my body of work called resonance started to develop. And that's now the work from then on, that was the work that I then, it started to move through me in a way that I can't necessarily explain. Love and um, it changed everything. So I want to bring the listener in here again and just ask the listener to hear the story that Jane has just told you. Um, a very successful business, an illness, that, or, or, or the birth of a child, an illness that then made her have to sell it. And I want you to see how there are inflection points in life where we think what we're doing is what we're always gonna be doing and then something happens and everything changes. And I want you to hear how many of those happen just in the short three minutes that Jane was talking. And she was encapsulizing, obviously, her life was longer than three minutes of that, of that happening. But where are your inflection points and how, and how often do you get stuck 
in this thought of the way you are now is the way you're all, you'll always be and what you're doing now is what you'll always do. And do you have the courage to do what she did, which is to sell a, a successful company and reinvent herself anew with what actually aligned, what I call the, mo the process of mosaicing yourself, wow. where you have pieces of yourself that are in different places that you isolate. The spiritual part of me and the work part of me can't really coincide together because they're different people. Who I am is not really who I present to the world that I am. But when we mosaic that all together, what happens is we have something more beautiful than any of the pieces and we are actually whole beings and then walking into whatever we do as a whole being rather than as a segmented being. Yeah. And I want you to see just how beautiful that is. In the work that you do, what part does listening play? Oh, it's everything. I think it was Mark Nepo who says, listening is the doorway to everything that matters in life. Mm -hmm. That's that. absolutely true. Yeah, it's, it's my superpower probably. <laughs> and, and so if listening is so important do you think people listen to each other no i think somehow we've forgotten how to dialogue i know this because i you know if i if i'm in a coffee shop and i hear a conversation you know happening behind me or i'm at a, before covid i was at conferences and listening to people talking to each other it's like people are, are having their own conversations with themselves. And, and when the other person's speaking, they're waiting, they're kind of ruminating on what they're going to say next and just waiting for their turn to speak again. I've noticed that a lot. We're all monologuing. Yeah. And di it's almost like we've forgotten how to truly dialogue with each other. So give me your best. I, I, I'm not expecting you to solve the world's problems here. <laughs> but, but part of what I'm all about is I want to create a revolution of listening. Oh, mm -hmm. because I believe that the simple act of listening yeah. would solve most of the problems that exist in the world today. Yeah. And see, now I'm interested because now I want to know also is when you say listening, where are you asking people to listen from? Because I do think that a lot of people think they just listen with their ears or particularly in corporate uh, organizations, just with their heads. They think their brain is the thing yeah. that listens. So can I share a story with you? Yeah, go for it. When I was given this commission to just listen and bring yeah. or start a revolution of listening, I went to my creator and I said, are, are, like, are you kidding? Like of all the people, <laughs> are we this low down on the totem pole that you're choosing me? I'm, I like talk so much. Yeah. Like, why are you giving this mission to me? I mean, isn't, there must be people that listen better than me. Right. And they, they said, Danny, the answer is twofold. One is we want you to learn how to listen. We're not doing it because you know how to listen. Right. We want you to really learn how to listen and where to listen from and what to listen to. But don't kid yourself. You do speak a lot. But what your speaking does is it allows people's minds to relax. Yeah. You're interesting enough with the words that you say that you activate the mind in the process of your story or in the process of what you're saying. The mind is what brings the most resistance to the heart and soul changing. Mm -hmm. And so as you're speaking, make sure you're also listening with your heart and your soul to what the heart and the soul of a company saying, a person saying, a family saying, a child saying, a school, a school is saying, a hospital is saying, a prison is saying, listen to what is being told to you. And then address that as you, as you can and draw that out in people. Yeah. Does that make any sense to you? Oh, totally. I mean, to me, that's what coaching is all about. And it's also, listening to what's not being said yes which is really important yes why do you think if we all know that listening is so important we just don't do it mm -hmm. i think we um i think we're socialized out of it a bit if i'm honest i think that um in school you know, we're, we're told to 
sit down and well in england i my experience was i was told to sit down shut up and listen yeah uh, it was kind of like a command i was also brought up with sayings in england like little girls should be seen and not heard yeah. okay and so very yeah, soon, we say that over here also but <laughs> but we don't just call them little girls it's uh, <laughs> all right little well, boys too okay so you know, well, and then when I think about, I don't think we do it unintentionally. I think it's part of how we're socialized into, particularly in the West, and I can put kind of England and, and America similar in this, in that we soon realize that to find our way in the world, we have to have confidence. We have to speak up. We need to be someone that the world needs us to be. Maybe not who we really are maybe that's not enough so therefore i do listen to learn and i think that that's still prevalent but i do need to speak up because america and england they're both what i would call extroverted cultures yeah so you you stay hidden if you don't speak up if you don't like if you're in a team meeting and you don't speak up or if you're in a family and you don't speak at the dining room table other people will and somehow I think we've got into a culture, probably quite unwittingly, where we have to speak, or we feel like we have to speak up, or else we will never be heard. And I think we have a primal sense for all of us that we just want to be seen and heard for who we truly are. I do believe that's deep down there, but I think there's a lot of stuff on top of it that we have to let go of before we can get there. So what if it weren't that hard? Because it sounds hard when you say it. Yeah, well, it's not hard though, is it? It doesn't seem like it is. But no, that, it's not do you understand hard. when I say it sounds hard? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because like, we think, but that's like everything, isn't it? We think change is hard, it's not. Yeah. We just need, and we usually need to unlearn rather than learn the new. Yeah. So I think it's the same with listening, yeah. So when I asked you about listening, hmm. you ended up speaking about the fact that we need, we've been conditioned to listen and not, and told not to speak. Yeah. And yet we want to speak and we want to be heard, but that doesn't really answer why we don't listen to my ear. Maybe I just didn't get it wrong. I'm not saying you didn't answer. Or, or, you know, or being combative. It just feels like, like, so I would imagine growing up in a culture where we were told little boys and girls should be seen and not heard, we would be the best listeners in the whole world because we were never given an opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. So we would actually be able to hear what people are saying. And then we might say, well, gosh, if, if I'm hearing what everybody else is saying, God, I'd like to be heard too. Mm -hmm but we would understand how, how important it is to be heard. But that isn't what you seem to be saying. So I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. but, that's, but that's where your mosaic comes in for me, because I'd really like to give you a very complex, there's probably a very complex answer to why we don't listen. But the other thing is it comes back to my question to you, what are we listening to? Yeah. So my assumption when you say, are we listening? is are we listening to each other? Whereas I think we are listening, it's what we're listening to. Is it those critical voices in our heads? Is it those things that tell us that, you know, we're, we're not good enough? Is it the imposter syndrome? Are we listening there instead of listening outside? Are we listening to the beliefs that we think we already know? Because once we know we're a closed energetic system, there's no need to open and listen to anybody else because we already know. So that, are we listening or are we not listening? Yeah, I think we're always listening. It's what we're listening to that creates the distinction. And if we're in conversation with somebody else, are we listening to ourselves or are we listening to them? Are we open yeah. even to a different point of view? And unfortunately in the world we live in today, it seems like we're less open maybe than we've ever been to difference and listening to others. Yeah. I would like to, I'm a big guy. So sometimes when I walk into a room, I consciously or unconsciously knock stuff off tables because I just, oh. bump, I just <laughs> bump into them. Okay. Right. Um, I like 
I like people to believe that I unconsciously do it, but oftentimes it's conscious. Okay. Because oftentimes what I see is people's tables are very cluttered with belief systems and things that they don't need anymore. Absolutely. And so I unconsciously, consciously bump into their table and everything goes onto the floor. And fortunately, I live in a world where there are rubber floors or things are not breakable or whatever it is, because I'm able to say to them, hey, you know what? I am so sorry. Um, I'm willing to pick up for you anything that you want, but what do you actually want back on your table? Because we don't have to put all this here. Again, if you don't want it, I'm happy to put it into a bag and put it someplace else. Question for you. Maybe I'm naive and I'd love your input on this. But I believe it doesn't matter what we listen to. I believe we need to listen to everything. The critical voices in our head are telling us something if we would listen to them and not fight them. The belief systems we're holding on to so dearly are trying to tell us something. Are try- the only reason they're repeating themselves over and over again is because somehow they don't feel that they've been listened to and heard. And until we believe, until we hear what it is the world is saying to us, it's only going to say it louder and louder. And it's not going to give us a chance to listen to anything else because it wants you to hear what it's saying. And once it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a child, once mm-hmm. the child gets screams and you go, Oh, what's happening? Tell me what you need. And, and you, and you listen to it. It stops. It stop, doesn't need to scream anymore. So then you can hear everything else in the room that's going on. Does that make sense to you? Oh, it does. Cause as you were talking about that, I was thinking that's exactly what COVID's done. It's knocked yeah. our table and said, okay, what do you want to put back on your table? Yeah. <laughs> And I love that. You're smart. You figure me out too quickly. (laughs) Yeah. So so let's go back to this thought of we don't, what are we really listening to? And Mm. what if there wasn't a distinction to what we had, what was right to listen to and what was wrong to listen to, but we just listened to everything and gave it its chance to be heard and allowed it then to rest what would we then, would we be able to hear more? Like in a conversation where people are just talking and talking and talking and saying what they believe over and over again. If the best way that I found in my little room, which we're in right now, is if I say to you, hey, I really want to hear you. You don't, like, I notice you're getting, you're starting to say it louder or you're starting to get upset. But like, I want to, if, if tell me if I'm not listening to you, I, I want to hear you because there's no reason for, like if you get heard, you don't need to yell at or scream at or tantrum or, or attack. So tell, like, this is your moment. Tell me. They say it once and it's over. And I say, well, how about if it wasn't that way? And they go, well, what, well, what, what do you mean? How, how else could it be? And I say, well, let's take a look. How else could it be? And suddenly there's a new perspective on the table because they're not defending that place. Does that make sense to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So may I ask you again, because you're really trained in this. Why do you think we don't give people the chance to get that to be heard so that they don't have to keep saying the same thing over and over again? I don't know that I have an easy answer to that. That's the first thing. And so it's interesting to think that I think I should have. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, t- you told me you were very clear in saying you are trained in this. You are, no, but like, you're okay, good. so what's the answer? But you so, are um, good at this. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, <laughs> you are good at this. And this is the work you do. And it's, it doesn't, it's okay yeah. not to know the answers, right? It is okay not to know the answer. And what's bubbling up for me is I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for other people. Beautiful. And when, when I oh, think can you about... Pause for one minute? Yeah. I just want to... Don't lose your train of thought. Yeah. I want the listener to just hear what happened. Because as okay. soon as Jane got to this place where I feel like I should know the answer because you set me up as I'm this <laughs> expert on this thing. And I don't really know what the answer is. 
um, and, and she got approval for that. Like, why would we know? These are hard questions, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and then she said, well, I can't really tell, speak for anybody else but myself. Yeah. How often in our conversations do we hold that point of view or do we have an agenda that I'm actually speaking to change your mind? as opposed to I'm sharing with you what I believe and what happens for me. And I want you to see how beautifully open and transparent Jane was in her ability to just walk right that into that place and, and, and showcase that for you. And can you do that in conversations where you're in disagreements or where you don't know, or when you don't know something, do you stand up and defend it even stronger? Because I don't know about you and the work you do, but I see the less people know, the more they defend the fact that they do know it. Right. right? right. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I'm so sorry I interrupted <laughs> you, but I, I didn't want to lose that moment for the audience. So you yeah. said you were saying, I, I don't know, but I can, I can only speak for myself. Yeah. So what came up for me initially was fear. And this is really interesting, Daniel, because as you've said, this is my work and this is the work I do. But fear came up and it was attached to the fact that if I listen to you or to any other person and they tell me something, so this is really interesting, and they tell me something that's different to what I believe and then I get what they're saying, then maybe I need to change something about myself or my life or my identity in the world or the place where I believe I belong or don't belong. Maybe I need to change something. And do I want to do that? I don't know. It's a bit exhausting all this change all the time. So it's like, oh, and then there's something unknown in listening. It's like I'm at the edge of my, to truly listen, as you've described with all of my energy and my body and my mind and my heart and my soul and to truly open and listen in that way means that I'm at my edge. I'm at my learning edge. I'm at the edge of what I know. And if I step off the edge, it's all a bit windy and uncertain. Mm -hmm. Like it, there's no ground there for me. Wow. So it might mean I need to redefine my ground or rethink something or stop doing something that I love because I need to be doing something else now. <laughs> so uh, it's like, I, oh, uh, can I not just stay being me as I am today without you and your input? <laughs> I, I love, I love, I love, I love how honest you are. And I love how real you are and how vulnerable you are and how, and how raw that is. And I yeah. want to ask the listener, do you feel how raw that is? because let's make it really simple. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna present it this way. If I'm wrong, please correct me in the way I'm seeing it from your point of view, okay? Yeah. But really what I hear is when we're at the edge of what we're comfortable at, that's our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And how willing or how much do we wanna go out of our comfort zone and really innovate, change, mm -hmm. see things differently? allow new possibilities, you know, yeah. and in companies and all those types of places and families, for God's sake, in schools and medicine, how willing are we to get to, I had someone in the room here and he, he spoke about something so beautiful, which was called, we always have to grow our edge. Mm -hmm. Our edge can never be the edge or else we become what was innovative for us now becomes comfort zone to us. Yeah. And as long as we are within our edges, we are in what, what we thought was an innovation is now just our comfort zone. So unless our edges are always growing, we really aren't continuing to push the boundaries of what we believe. Exactly. But you said it so beautifully because, God, can I just stop changing every once in a while and just be yeah. okay with where I sit right now? Yeah. And the beautiful, for me, the beautiful answer is you can choose to be wherever you want. You can sit in the middle of your comfort zone if that's where you're comfortable being, right? Yeah, and, and I'm not. And, <laughs> and, and you're not, right? But, but like yeah. for the listeners and every, you get to choose where you want to be in this roadmap that's called your life, which is so yeah. beautiful. Yeah. If you're comfortable in the middle and you want to take some time off, like I'm a box, I used to be a boxer. 
And there was a certain amount of time where you just felt like you got in those later rounds, you felt tired. And so you just right. wanted to take a little bit of a round off, you know, so you would protect yeah. one go. So, you know, you would, you would you'd stand and protect yourself and do whatever you, and it's okay to take a round off. Yeah. It's okay to take a lifetime off if that's what you choose to do. But if you choose to be somebody who says that's not what you choose to do, then how do you reconcile the, the broken pieces of your mosaic that are saying to you, I need to take a rest? And what are they really saying? So if you were to listen to them, what are they really saying? Maybe they're only saying, I need to take a rest for a few moments. Like, just let me sit yeah. here for a few moments and relish the fact that I don't have to change today. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> Right. Yes. <laughs> I'll wake up tomorrow. Like sometimes you go to bed yeah. and the dishes are still in the sink and you just didn't do them and you're just too tired. You don't want to do them. You wake up then in the morning and you sort of have the energy You come in and you just say, okay, I'm going to yeah. let, let me knock these out because you're rested and you're, and, and what was hard for you in the evening before is easy. Yeah. What's important to you, Jane? Oh, gosh. Love. Life. Health. Connections. Hmm. And bringing forward my contribution to make the world a better place. I could say, theoretically, fulfilling my potential and inspiring others to do the same. That's one of the things I say professionally. And it really is true, but um, I don't know what the but is as a but. Hmm. I think it's, um, what's important to me is now collective, is that we humans wake up and see where we are and take responsibility for the future generations and start to think in a more long-term rather than a short-term win kind of way. What do you think That's... would happen if we don't wake up? Why is that so important that we wake up? I think it's important because I believe that we are <clears throat> literally raping the earth of, um, with all of our extractive practices. You know, we are taking more than we need. It's our systems, our, everything has become all about more, 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 more. I mean, I think about the people that I've worked with over the decades and, you know, like I've seen so many vision statements, and <laughs> mission statements, which could all be replaced by just sticking behind the receptionist, just the word more in capital letters. We want more, right? I've seen that. I've seen it play out. I've seen... I, I, first of all, hold it. That's so <laughs> brilliantly simple. And have you seen it also, listener? I mean, isn't that so true? <laughs> yeah. I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, you, you just, you've seen mission statements and vision statements that could easily yeah. be replaced by a sign behind the secretary saying more. Yeah, and it's just this mindless pursuit of growth and more. For what? Like, for what? And I know we have systems and structures that now define the way we need to be in society in order to survive. And if we're lucky enough to be born in, in the West, then chances are, hopefully, we've got some chance of education, some chance of having food and water and people that care about us around us that can help us to thrive. But the inequalities are staggering, yeah. staggering. The pain of the world, I feel it. I feel it, Daniel. And I've just gone through my own like life moment where my first grandchild was born. Wow. And I got Phoebe in my arms for the first time and felt all the overwhelming love I thought I would feel, quickly followed by despair and sadness that I was bringing her as a girl into this world. And I don't know if it's the world I want her to come into. I, I think there are a is. lot of people. I used to end this show by saying to people, by asking a question, I might as well ask it now, not end it. <laughs> um, 
Is this the world that you want your children and your grandchildren to inherit? No, absolutely effing not. Okay. Capital letters, shouty capitals, as loud as I can get them. <laughs> no. And I think we got that. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, there's a force in the world that is undisputable. And that force is momentum. Yeah. That the more we continue to do with the things that we continue to do, the more those things get power and continue to happen. So if you could say one thing to the world right now that they could do to halt that momentum so that this world in next time we talk, maybe 10 years from now, you can say, yeah, you know what? 10 years ago, I couldn't say yes. But if we keep doing this, I, I would love to give this world over to my kids and grandkids. What would that one thing be? I think that one thing would be to realize who you are and why you're here on the planet at this time. We're all here for a reason and there's a sacred reason for that. So to give the listeners an experience of that is just imagine yourself as you are right now and then think behind you are all your ancestors all the people who had to come together and love each other enough to create the line of ancestry that became you in this lifetime they're all behind you they're all smiling and cheering and and hoping that you will realize the real reason your purpose your destiny in being on the earth at this time so know they're all behind you. They give you your ground. They're all here cheering and supporting you. And then look to the sides of you, to all the colleagues, all the people, the family, the friends, the colleagues that love you. Maybe it's clients and customers too that love you. And know they're there cheering you, supporting you, wanting you to fulfill your potential in this lifetime. And then look ahead to the future generations, to the people that will come after you. Maybe it's your grandchildren, your children, your nieces, your nephews, your friends' children, the generations that are to come, the leaders of our world that have yet to be born. And think about how what you do or don't do today will have an impact on their lives, just like all those people behind you had an impact on yours. Yeah. And then it takes me to the quote that Gandalf said, <laughs> What will you do with the time that you have been given? It's the only choice you mm. have to make. Mm. And is it Mary Oliver who said, what will you do with this one wild and precious life? Mm. That's your choice. I'm not here to tell you what to do with that. But just realize how important you are because we're all interconnected in this biosphere, this ecosystem of life. And what you do or don't do really matters because the time is now i mean the time was actually a few decades previously but the time is now we're probably the most important people who have ever lived because we're the ones who will decide whether humanity continues or not mm. on this planet yeah and you have a role to play Love and we that. need you <laughs> if you do nothing else but rewind right here to about two minutes ago three minutes ago and just listen to that over and over again, then this show will have been tremendously worthwhile. I would like to lob something over the net again to you. Yeah, do. I had someone who came in this room that really helped to broaden my perspective. And we were talking about the situation that the world's in. And he said to me, Danny, the world's fine. Yeah. Like the world, it's the question is whether we will be able to inhabit this world. I agree. But if we, if we continue to play the games we're playing, we will no longer be able to inhabit the world, but then the world will fix itself just like it did in the first two yep. weeks of COVID, right? All of a sudden, Belizean was gone. <laughs> you know, we could see things again. I mean, yep. the world... What's at stake is not the planet. 
No. What's, what's at stake is our existence on the planet. Exactly. And I thought yeah. that was so such an interesting, because I always thought, well, no, we're killing the planet. We don't have that power, I don't think. No, I don't think we do either. And it will, it will regenerate itself because it's incredibly uh, resilient. Yeah. Where does trust live in your life? Oh, front and center. Yeah, if um, I don't trust easily, but when I do, I, I trust. It's hard to turn me back from that. Um, and I think trust is, for me, it's the, it gives us our ground in which we can resonate, let me put it that way. Yeah. Without trust, I don't think there's any connections between us. I think all that falls away. And so I think trust is front and center because yeah. it's also where we place our attention and where we place our attention is really important. Yeah. So I think trust is a core piece in your mosaic. Definitely. <laughs> I agree with you. And I want to ask the listener if you hear the same thing I hear, and I'm going to question myself by asking Jane to clarify for me. Mm. Um, trust is front and center. Mm. Jane said, I don't trust easily, but when I trust, I trust, you know, fully. Yeah. With all, I mean, it wasn't fully, wasn't her word, but I, it, it's, a, it's, I almost want to say religiously, but it's not religiously. It's, a, <laughs> it's, a, she, she trusts, you know, she trusts completely. Yes. And yet my experience of you is slightly different than that. Here I am an imperfect, here I am an imperfect stranger that you've never met before. Yeah. And you've been completely vulnerable. Yeah. completely honest, completely qualities that I would say are the results of trust. That somehow you trusted enough in this room that you would be okay here to be able to let your guard down, even around some of the things that you say in your business statement. And you said, there's a but there, and I don't know what that but is, but that's you know how much honesty that takes and how much trust that takes in this in a room like this so for someone who doesn't trust easily how is it that you trusted so easily with me or did you not or is this just am i misunderstanding so, it no I, so i'll challenge you on the fact that you think this and it takes trust in a way because when you faced your own death there isn't much that can not me off my own ground of yes. trusting myself. Okay. I didn't need to trust you. Uh, to be vulnerable. I, love that. I just needed to trust myself. And I don't know you. So, you know, do I care about what you think? Mm, I've been through, I faced my own death, Daniel. Yes. Face your own death, you realize. And, and, I, and I will, I've said this to my family and I'll say it here which is that there isn't much now that can happen to me that would make me lose my ground. There really isn't. There is one thing that I really worry about, which is if something happened to one of my children or now my grandchild, I really don't know how parents live through the loss of a child. I've, I've yeah. never been through that and hopefully I never will have to. But apart from that, I don't need any masks in the world. And of course I have them, we all have them to some extent. But for me, it's a continuous process of opening because when I made that decision to come back to life, I, and I had to make that decision. I was in a hospital bed and I knew that I was dying. And I knew that the doctors, had, I, they'd not told me formally, but I knew. And I could feel the light diminishing in my body. And I knew I had to choose life. Was I going to choose life or was I just going to go along with the flow? And I was headed towards my own death, right? What was yeah. I going to do? And I chose life. Obviously I'm here, but I couldn't choose life for myself in that moment. 
Jane wasn't enough to come back to life for, but my kids were. Wow. I didn't want my kids not to have a mum. But then I've realized every day since then, this is not just something that happens to people with terminal diagnosis. Everyone who's listening, when you wake up in the morning, you get to choose. Are you going to choose life today or not? Yeah. And if you choose life, why not open to it fully, whatever it has to bring? Why go into life with a portion of you when you could be fully open to the experience that's waiting? I love that. So for me, that's, I didn't need to trust you, Daniel. I just needed to trust myself. That I was love it. that. So are you old enough to remember overhead projectors? Of course. I used to use them. <laughs> <laughs> Felt I, it pens drawing on them. <laughs> I love overhead projectors. So I want you to put that last beautiful <laughs> paragraph on a, on a plastic sheet of paper and put okay. it on the overhead projector. Yeah. And then I want you to put yeah. these words, I don't trust easily on another yeah. sheet of paper. Yeah. And I want, to I want you to tell me if both those stories are current stories, if they go along with each other, if one has sort of replaced each of the other without you even realizing it, if one's an old story, or what do they look like when they're both sitting there on the, they're both true. So that's interesting because they, uh, on first glance, seem like polarities. And, yes. you know, we think that polarities are opposite, and they are. But, of course, that's the beauty of the human condition. We can hold polarities, and they can be opposite, and they can both be true. And for me, as I put that on there, they're both true. They both have a place. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I just want to bring to the listeners awareness how important it is to ask questions that allow people to clarify without accusing them of something. Mm. Yeah. Because to my eye, I could have said, hold it, you're not telling the truth. How can you have both of these things? And it, but when I listen for information, do you hear the richness of the information that comes that we can believe polarities, that they are both true. We can hold them both at the same time. Yeah. And the image seems perfectly real to us and perfectly har harmonious and sync with us. <laughs> yeah. Right. It may not seem in sync to anybody else, but who the hell cares? Yeah. Right. I mean, it, all it has to do is look in sync to us. Yeah. And so it's so beautiful to just be able to ask with a desire to learn rather than with a desire to accuse or, or catch somebody in something. And I'm just so happy that someone who doesn't listen very well as myself has, has been learning how to listen through the process of just no agenda listening. Yeah. We're going to have all your information in the show notes. Um, and I'm sure people are going to want to get in touch with you because I'm sure they've fallen in love with you as I have. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Oh, what, that what, would be, so much. what would be the <laughs> one best way for them to get in touch with you? Do you check one thing more than other things and the um, information you're going to give us? No, I'll just say you've probably already um, heard that, you know, I'm passionate about changing the world. So, and what's funny after the conversation we've had is I have a brand called Sacred Changemakers. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Um, and so, um, yeah, come, come along and, uh, yeah, and you can connect with me there, definitely. We have a free Facebook group on Facebook where we're bringing together souls who are interested in a new, different world, I guess. People who care about our future. And uh, we're supporting each other in that. And I couldn't do the work I do in the world without that community. Love it. Um, yeah. So thank you. And I want to thank you because I have to tell you, I've been on so many different interviews, you know, over the past few months. And this has been exquisite to be listened to, to be just, just to, just to know that I've, connected with you a complete stranger in yeah. such a short amount of time yeah 
And it's down to the fact and the way you listened. So I love that. And I really want to thank you for that because it's been such a gift for me today. Thank you. My absolute honor. You really summed up the show for me because what I say to people is that I purposely don't know anything about the people that come into this room before they come into this room. Yeah. I don't want to know what they do or who they are, or how they present themselves because I really want them to be strangers when they come into this room. Yeah. And I want to see as a social experiment in my own life. My mom always told me, don't talk to strangers. <laughs> and she would be, she'd be turning over in her grave now. She saw me just only talking to strangers. Um, but when you think about it, like what, what beauty there is in just being able to yeah. sit with someone you don't know and see how rich the conversation is, to see how much you share, to see how much you can learn from every single person that exists yeah. and how we rob ourselves of that opportunity when we just stay in the silo that we stay in of all the people that think like us, believe like us, look like us, feel like us. Yeah. And so I want to invite you to do what my friend Corey, who was a homeless man, said to me when i asked him you see all these people walking by what would you say to them if you could say one thing he said i would tell them to take 10 minutes out of the course of their life and just go up to someone you don't know and just ask them how they're doing yeah he told me a long story which i won't tell here again but he said it was because somebody did that to me that i'm still here today i was going to kill myself that evening but they took 10 minutes and just listened to me and I couldn't do it anymore. Go up to somebody you don't know. You might just find you like it so much, you might actually want to go up to someone you do know and do the same exact thing. Yeah. But when the yeah. world is full of strangers, we live in a strange world. How long did it take for Jane and I to get to know each other? Moments, minutes? Okay, say we talked for an hour, say it took the whole hour if you're disbelief. But I believe this woman's now my friend. I believe when I go to Columbus, Ohio, or she comes to San Diego, we'll make sure we see each other. We'll, we'll, we'll go out of our way to see each other because we've connected here and we feel something with each other. When strangers become friends, a strange world becomes a friendly world. And this world could sure use a friendlier world right now. So what would it take for you to just go up and talk to somebody you don't know? Make the commitment to me, make it to Corey, make it to yourself to do that. Jane, is there anything you want to say last thing before we head out? I love your message. I love what you're doing, I love you. And I believe that the world definitely needs more love right now, so thank you. Thank you. It is my honor and I hope this is not the end of our conversation, but the beginning of a lot more conversations and yeah. to see how we might be able to play together and do things and <laughs> how beautiful would it be if this world that we start to play together, that people listening start to call on you to, exactly. to help them do things. That this isn't strange, this is natural. Yeah. That we just come to each other and help each other grow and achieve what we want. So to all of you who are listening, I wanna thank you for coming. Jane, I wanna thank you for being here with us and giving of yourself so completely, so fully, so transparently. What a treat to know you. To those of you who listen, if you like this, please share it with people you like. That's the way we do things. We go to a restaurant, we like it, we tell friends we like about it, right? Well, we listen to a show that we like, why not share it with your friends and tell them that you liked it and see what they do and they'll share it with friends that they like. And pretty soon we have a revolution of listening that's started. You can do it too. There's nothing special that I have. The motto is simple. We love and accept each other. We listen to each other and hear what we're saying. We acknowledge and validate people. And we walk into each conversation with no agenda. Try it. Until the next stranger comes in, be friends.
be kind to each other, love each other, be kind to yourself, love yourself. And we'll see you when the next stranger comes in. God bless. Thank you.